So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the uh, kind invitation to this conference, uh, which also gives me the opportunity to congratulate personally with Boris Alshuler, and it's a great pleasure to do it. Uh, the work I will tell you about has been done uh, in Catania in our group together with Pino Falci and Antonio D'Arrigo. Part of the results I will present have been obtained in collaboration with Giuliano Benenti from Como, Rosario Lofranco from Palermo, and uh, part in collaboration with the experimental group of Paolo Mataloni and Fabio Sciarino in Rome. Now, uh, uh, it's... Uh, we are all aware of the fact that entanglement plays a key role in quantum information and communication applications. This includes, of course, quantum algorithms, but also teleportation, quantum dense coding, private key distribution, and reduction of communication complexity. Now, similarly to what happened with classical networks, uh, quantum networks are now envisaged with, uh, with a great uh, potential for uh, further uh, improvement. Uh, this is just the uh, sketch. This is a sketch of a notional quantum network, which consists of uh, quantum nodes, where the information is uh, generated, is processed, and it's uh, stored. These quantum nodes are connected by uh, quantum channels, which uh, uh, transfer quantum state from one side to, this, to the other and uh, distribute entanglement across the entire network. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, there is uh, presently the prospect that uh, different tasks can be uh, implemented on different platforms. And one prospect consists in using the advantages of natural and artificial atoms in a hybrid quantum computational scheme, which is sketched here. And the idea is to use natural atoms with their long coherence time as quantum memories to perform operation in, uh, by using artificial atoms, which are tunable, realizing a sort, a sort of quantum processing unit with input-output photonic interfaces. Now, this is at presently just a prospect. The point is that entanglement is also a very fragile resource, which depends on hardware intrinsic noise sources. And this is a problem in all stages of the computation. So uh, it's a problem during generation, during processing, during storage. Uh, this happens in quantum memories, which are important not only for quantum algorithms, but also for quantum communication over long distances and, of course, also during distribution through noisy communication channels. Now, in solid-state platform, the major drawback comes from material inherent noise sources, which often have a spectrum which is structured, often 1 over f and low frequencies. And uh, in the present, uh, in the present uh, talk, I will uh, present to you how a quantum control technique could be used to preserve entanglement in uh, complex architectures in the presence of 1 over f noise. The main goal will be to show that entanglement can be recovered by dynamical decoupling acting locally on each subsystem. Uh, there, there will be two uh, parts in this presentation. The first one will concern about entanglement storage, and I will present a prototype of a distributed architecture where quantum nodes are acted by classical noise, non-Markovian noise, I will show how entanglement revivals can be induced by a local control, and I will propose an interpretation of these results in terms of quantum correlations, which are, in some sense, we'll see later, hidden in the system description. Then I will present an experiment performed in Rome in an all-optical setup, which allowed to show how uh, entanglement can be recovered on demand. Then the second part uh, will be focused on the possibility to achieve an high fidelity universal to cubic gate in the presence of local 1 over f noise, and how this can be achieved by using dynamical decoupling acting locally on each uh, of the cubic parts of the gate. But first of all, 1 over f noise. Uh, we already heard and we know all that it's an ubiquitous phenomenon which has been in the forefront of unsolved problems for, for a long time. Now, since the advent of mesoscopic physics, 1 over f fluctuations with 1 over f spectrum have been measured in, 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 many, in many systems, and the importance of magnetic flux, 1 over f noise in, in squids, is known since, since the 80s. Now, with the interest uh, for nano devices, uh, in, in also uh, uh, for, for their long-term potential quantum computation, quantum information, 
there's been a very large effort, both at the theoretical and the experimental uh, level, uh, aimed, uh, uh, first of all, and understanding which are the microscopic noise sources of one over F noise, and which is the induced defacing, and how can be uh, reduced uh, to some extent. Now, the latest development at the theoretical level in this field have been uh, summarized in this review, where I had the uh, chance to collaborate with Yuri Galperin and, and with Boris Salchuler, and it was uh, also a very great pleasure to do that. It was an honor. And this is a, a sketch of the typical 1 over F noise, which is uh, measured. Now, uh, this is an illustrative figure. The lines are the theoretical prediction of the 1 over F uh, uh, behavior with alpha close to 1. And typically, this behavior is uh, between a minimum and a, a maximum cutoff, which typically are not known. Those are the typical experimental data, which are usually taken in limited frequency ranges, possibly with different detection techniques. And uh, different variables uh, in the same setup, for instance, uh, magnetic flux and critical current noise, may display different amplitude of the 1 over F noise and may also display this behavior in different frequency ranges. Typically, at the system operating frequencies, noise is homic or uh, white, except from the recent result which Lara Paolo presented uh, two days ago. And uh, um, concerning the origin of 1 over F noise, they, they really depend on the, specific, on the specific setup. This is just a sketch of some of the possible noise sources in superconducting nanocircuits where one can observe either charge or critical current or magnetic flux noise. It's not possible to uh, include in a single slide all the possible noise sources, but this is just a selection of some of the most um, ubiquitous in this kind of, of systems. Um, these noise sources are called intrinsic noise sources. They depend on the materials which are used. In particular, we have a charge noise, which comes from charged impurities, which are located either in the substrate where the device is built or inside the tunnel junction itself. Being charged objects, they produce a fluctuating polarization of the superconducting island here, and they induce defacing for this reason. But on top of that, also quasi-particle tunnelings play a role. Uh, trapped vortices play a role. Uh, electron spin diffusion could be another source of, of defacing, and there is, of course, more to come. In addition to that, as I mentioned, uh, there are uh, noise sources which behave, um, which give a, a homic or white noise be, um, power spectrum, and these are usually coming from the electromagnetic environment where the device is, uh, is operating, which are neither to control and to manipulate. Now, the focus of this presentation will not be on uh, noise sources, but rather on the effect of 1 over F noise. And one possible way to describe the effect of no, uh, 1 over F noise is sketched here in the case of a qubit, here by the Pauli, described by the Pauli matrices sigma, in the presence of noise acting along, for instance, the sigma z direction. Now, the issue is that uh, 1 over F noise since, uh, can be treated as a classical stochastic drive, uh, which can be treated in the adiabatic approximation, valid, of course, if the high frequency cutoff of the noise is lower than the typical system operating frequency <coughs> and four times shorter than the system relaxation time. Now, in this scheme, the system evolution is expressed in terms of the instantaneous eigenstates of the system, which depend on the noise realization, and the effect of the noise enters also in the instantaneous eigenstates and in the instantaneous eigenvalues. In order to describe the system, we need to average over all the realization of the stochastic process with this path integral with a, pro with a prefactor here, which uh, is a, um, uh, depends on the specific measurement protocol or the operation we perform on the system and on a joint probability distribution function of the stochastic process. The effect of uh, modification of the instantaneous eigenstate by the noise is included in this contribution here, which is a transverse factor, whereas the effect of fluctuation of the eigenvalues is included in this contribution here. These are the eigen splittings, and we can call it longitudinal contribution. Now, since actually phase fluctuations accumulate in time, these are believed to be the most uh, dangerous effect coming from 
uh, one where FNO is treated in this adiabatic approximation. So one is legitimate to perform what is called a longitudinal approximation, which simply amounts to uh, include the effort all in the noise only in the fluctuations of the instantaneous eigen splitting. In this, these are the uh, structure of the uh, reduced density matrix element. And actually, one can make even a simpler approximation, which actually capture many of the experimental observation, which consists in replacing the uh, stochastics, uh, the stochastic uh, noise, X of T, with a fluctuating initial value of the stochastic process at each repetition of the measurement protocol which is performed. This basically describes an effect which is totally analogous so in homogeneous broadening. And in this case, the system density matrix just reduces to an ordinary integral. With this probability function, in all situations where the central limit theorem applies, can be taken of Gaussian form with a variance, sigma, which enters the amplitude of the 1 over f spectrum. <coughs> now, uh, in, during the year, there's been a, a considerable pro, the years there have been a considerable progress in reducing the effect of 1 over f noise. And uh, this has been based on different strategies. On one side, there is clever engineering. And for instance, circuit QED architecture are in this perspective. The other uh, strategy is to make the system operate at so-called optimal points where the system is basically um, uh, the, uh, operating condition reduce sensitivity, intrinsically reduce sensitivity to one over F noise. And this can be illustrated by, the, by, by this uh, simple uh, slide. Let's assume we have a qubit with Hamiltonian along the sigma z acted by a noise which is transverse with respect to sigma z. Now, under this condition, the uh, static path approximation, which I just introduces, I introduced, gives a reduced density matrix element, a coherence, which decays algebraically with, a, uh, only, with the only parameter relating the no related to noise being this variance. And actually, this simple algebraic behavior has been observed uh, initially in the quantronium, which at that time was the most performant, uh, one of the most performant circuits, and later also in, in different setups. Now, why is this uh, behavior optimal? Since simply because if we look at the completely um, uh, opposite uh, situation where the noise is longitudinal, so along sigma z, the effect of low frequency noise is to induce a, an exponential quadratic decay, which is certainly much worse than an algebraic decay. And this is what happens at the so-called longitudinal or pure defacing noise. Now, these strategies are basically passive uh, stabilization strategies. On top of that, also dynamical decoupling has been used as a strategy to uh, reduce the effect of low frequency noise. It's, based, it's basically inspired to NMR, and the idea of dynamical decoupling is just to um, uh, act on the system with pulses at selected time with control pulses in such a way that the effect of the environment which is accumulated before the pulse is effectively cancelled during the evolution F after the pulse. Yuri Galperin illustrated already the main idea here, I sketch it in the case of the two pulse echo. I suppose we have a qubit uh, with transverse noise in this case. And then I let <coughs> imagine the system freely evolves for a time delta t in the presence of noise. Then we have a pulse, an R pulse, so instantaneous ideally uh, pulse, along the z direction, so perpendicular with respect to the system environment interaction. Then there is a second free evolution time, lasting delta t, 2, and then a second pi pulse. The effect of the two uh, pulses is, is actually to reverse the sign of the system bath interaction. Here, sketched for the simple case where the noise is supposed to be totally static. And it's easy uh, to see that uh, such, uh, such a pulse sequence basically cancels classical noise at frequencies sm smaller than the inverse of the interval between the pulses uh, at time 2 delta t. If uh, we apply a sequence of uh, pi pulses, uh, equidistant pi pulses, we get uh, the so-called periodic dynamical decoupling, which is uh, expected to eliminate noise at frequencies smaller than 1 over delta t, but for a longer time, 2n delta t the limit delta t going to zero and giving the ideal zeno limit where the effective Hamiltonian is completely, um, we completely uh, get rid of the uh, system path interaction. But this is an ideal limit. 
Now, it has been proposed that non-equidistant pulses can give a, a improved efficiency. And indeed, one of the generalization is the so-called URIC dynamical decoupling sequence, which consists of uh, pulses along the y direction. And the idea behind this sequence is sketched here. This is the qubit, single qubit coherence in the presence of uh, pure defacing noise. Uh, uh, it decays with a factor gamma, uh, depending on the number of applied pulses. And it, it can be written in this form. This is the power spectrum of the noise. This is a so-called filter function, which de depends on the number of applied pulses. And in the Heurig uh, sequence, the idea is to choose the timing of the pulses in such a way that the first n derivatives of this filter function at zero frequency are all vanishing. This gives this recipe for the time of the pulses. And this um, strategy is aimed to reduce the effect of uh, the, the lowest order effect of a Gaussian noise to order Tn. Now, since then, other sequences have been uh, considered, which are optimized or robust under some conditions. The ones I will consider are the Carparcel and the Carparcel Maibungil sequences, which are sketched in this way. Both of them have been implemented in superconducting qubits in these two experiments, for instance. Now, uh, beside these two sequences, further sequences have been, have, been, have been proposed. This is a list of references, which for sure is not complete. I apologize for that. But just to see, say that the, the field is, is quite broad, um, from the point of view of um, superconducting circuits, uh, the feasibility of dynamical decoupling one over f for random telegraph noise has been proved in different setups, at least at the single qubit level, and to some instances also for entanglement. Here, the point of our, of our work is to show how this can be done by using local operations. And in order to understand what happens, at least in some cases, let me consider this very simple example. Let's assume we have two qubits, which are initially prepared in a fully entangled state and then they are decoupled. So they freely evolve under the presence of local uh, low frequency classical noise. Now what happens uh, if we evaluate the uh, one entanglement quantifier, for instance, the entanglement of formation as a function of time in the presence of a very low frequency noise, what I call here static noise, is to uh, uh, the entanglement of formation decays in time. This is given by this red curve. Now, what happens if I apply an alpi pulse at some time here is basically to do the same job I discussed for the two pulse sequence. It basically changes the sign of the system bath interaction, in this case, in a pure defacing kind of interaction. The result is that the entanglement recovers after a time which is uh, twice the uh, free evolution time. So after a time equal to uh, corresponding to the same time interval after the pulse. The efficiency of the recovery depends on how, let's say, non-Markovian is the noise with a complete recovery in the case of static noise and with a partial recovery where the noise correlation time decreases. Now, the, the re physical reason for this effect in this case is very simple. In this case, the local pulse applied, uh, in this case, we consider the noise uh, acting only on one of the two qubits and the pulse only on one of the two qubits. So the pulse uh, acting on qubit A basically refocuses qubit A uh, evolution and coherence. And then uh, for this reason, the entanglement between the two qubits is, is, is recovered with, a, with an efficiency depending on the correlation time of the noise. So the, uh, the picture is very, is very simple. But let me rephrase this simple result in a different terminology, which has some implication when looking at this result from a quantum information point of view. So the picture is the following. We usually, uh, when, we usually have a bipartite, when we have a bipartite system, we usually have access to a reduced density matrix, which in general is expressed in terms of pure state evolution with some probability. But the issue is that, in principle, this decomposition can be done in an infinite number of ways. Now, if we have access only to the reduced density matrix, we can only calculate the entanglement of the average state, which is defined here. This he is a one entanglement quantifier, which simply reduces to the entropy of entanglement for pure state. So typically, if the system is preparing an entangled state and let freely uh, evolve, 
under the presence of noise, this entanglement decays in time. But if uh, a specific physical decomposition is known, meaning that we know the quantum ensemble of pure states and probabilities, then if we are able to tag each member of the ensemble and to know its state, it is possible to distill the average entanglement of the quantum ensemble by using local control and classical communication. The average entanglement of the quantum ensemble is defined uh, in, in this way, where here the entanglement quantifier acts on the pure state. Now, the difference between these two quantities, if E is uh, a generic co convex function uh, measuring entanglement, is positive, meaning that the difference between these two quantities is always a positive quantity. And this quantity actually has a physical meaning because basically it describes the entanglement which we cannot exploit as a resource simply because we have a lack of classical knowledge on which state of the ensemble we are dealing with. This, once this information is recovered in some way, this uh, entanglement can be recovered and this can be done without no local operations. Now, this general statement in, uh, in our uh, simple example is easily understood. And we can look at this in this way. We have our system where qubit A is acted by local noise. Assume this is a very low frequency noise. In the limit, uh, uh, we consider the static path approximation where x is a stochastic uh, Gaussian variable with variance sigma squared. Now, what happens in this case is that the system uh, is always in a maximally entangled state during its time evolution, basically with a phase, which is this x, which we are not aware of. So this means that the, uh, we know the density matrix, and this, in this averaging uh, of, the, of the system state over this phase, the entanglement of formation, for instance, decays in time because of our lack of classical knowledge on this phase. What the local hecopulse actually does is to uh, retrieve the classical information uh, on this phase if the dynamics is non-Markovian. And the reason why this can happen is that the entanglement is actually always in the system meaning that we have a specific physical decomposition for the system given by this quantum ensemble, where x is the static realization of the noise, and p of x is this Gaussian probability distribution. So the entanglement of the ensemble A, since the system is uh, time by time in a fully entangled state, is always equal to 1. It is this 1 here. So this means that during the evolution since one time instance on, there is a, some entanglement which is inside the system, but it is hidden because of our lack of classical knowledge on the system phase. What the pulse does is to provide this information and allows the recovery. So the original results I have shown you a few slides ago can be rephrased by simply saying that after the pulse, there is a backflow of the classical information on the system phase, which the environment has acquired during the evolution before the pulse. And this allows to recover the amount of entanglement, which is in this sense hidden in the system. If we apply a sequence of pulses in a periodic dynamical decoupling sequence, sequence we have a uh, larger um, recovery of entanglement, these entanglement revivals. Now, this uh, result has actually been shown also in this experiment, which we did in collaboration with the group of Rome. Here, the uh, two qubits are the photon polarization of qubit A of qubit P, which can be either horizontal or vertical. And the system is initially prepared in a fully entangled state by a spontaneous down, um, parametric down conversion source. Then qubit A evolves, uh, is, is, let, uh, is directly measured. Whereas qubit B uh, suffers from the interaction with an environment. And this environment, in this case, is basically simulated. And it is simulated by making qubit B uh, interact stroboscopically at, time, at times tk with liquid crystal retarders, these ones, whose effect is basically to introduce on qubit B a phase factor key, k. This phase factor depends on the applied voltage of, to the liquid crystal retarder. So in this experiment, it's something we can, which we can control. 
but which can create a phase which is uh, varying between zero and pi. Now, in order to have really a stochastic process, what is done is then n sequence of pulses, of phases, they only have four liquid crystal retarders, so they generate n sequences of these four phases uh, in such a way that these key, key k, these variables, are Gaussian random variables with some degree of correlation, which is given by this parameter mu, mimicking a non-Markovian dynamics, equal to one in the case of complete non-Markovianity. Now, uh, this experiment consists in three parts. In the first part, the system is let to freely uh, evolve. So we have an uncontrolled dynamics. In this case, we are aware, perfectly aware, of the quantum ensemble of the system, which can be expressed in this form, these states, new k1, kk, a step k of the procedure, so a time tk, if you wish, are always given by a fully entangled state, where only the phase of uh, photon B has been modified by going through the liquid crystal retarders. Now, what happens in this case is that the uh, entanglement of the, uh, the average, the very average, entang the average entanglement of the ensemble is always one, since the system is in a fully entangled state. But if we evaluate the entanglement of the density matrix described in the system, we have a decay. And this is signaled by the fact that the entanglement of formation look only at the black points decay in time. These steps correspond to time evolution of the system. So we have a decay in time. Dots are the experimental points. Lines are the theoretical prediction. In continuous line is for a, a pure maximally entangled state, uh, whereas the dashed lines correspond to a, a source of error, which is a non-perfect um, fully entangled state at the preparation stage. But you clearly see this decay. Now, this is the first part of the experiment. The second part of the experiment consists in compensating the phase. Since in this case, the environment is simulated, this is possible. And how can we do? We can simply choose the phase of the last liquid crystal retarder equal to minus the sum of the phases in the steps before, in, the, in all the steps before. So what happens in this case is that the entanglement, uh, what happens in this case is shown here by the blue points. So at the last step, a compensating phase is given, and the result is to have an entanglement which is almost equal to the one which was present initially. The meaning of this part of the experiment is to be sure that entanglement degradation under this experimental condition is only due to the lack of classical knowledge on the system phase which is acquired which the system has acquired during the evolution. The last part of the experiment consists in applying an ecopulse. And the ecopulse is applied at midway of this evolution, and it basically consists to a, a local bit flip, a step k of the procedure. The local bit flip on qubit b changes, this was a v becomes h, this was h becomes b, and in such a way that the state of the system after the application of the second uh, of this uh, equipulse is basically given by this, again, fully entangled state, but with a phase which has a different sign with respect to the phases which have been acquired before. The result of this operation is that we have, in the case of uh, totally correlated noise, a almost completely recover, a almost complete recovery of entanglement at time four, step four of this procedure. The degree of the recovery depends on the degree of um, no Markovian dynamics, if you want, and as long as this mu becomes smaller, you see that the amount of entanglement recovered decreases. This is a, a proof uh, in this experimental optical setup of the possibility of achieving on-demand recovery of entanglement through a local operation when the environment is classical and non-Markovian. Here, the pulse playing the role of the local operation, which gives us the classical information on the system phase. So this is the first part of my presentation. In the second part, I would like to uh, address the issue of the possibility of achieving an universal high fidelity to cubic gate in a superconducting nanocircuit by uh, local dynamical decoupling acting on the two gates, so on the two qubits, so local in this sense. And the idea is to apply pulses during the gate operation. So it's what is usually called decouple while compute strategy. 
and we will consider different decoupling sequences. So the idea is the following. Let's assume we have two qubits, qubit 1 and qubit 2. These two are resonant, and they are coupled by a transverse coupling, so via sigma x. This is the level structure of the uncoupled system with the two plus minus and minus plus levels which are degenerate. The coupling between the two removes the degeneracy and generates what is called swap subspace. What happens in this subspace is simple. If the system is prepared in a factorized state, free evolution leads to a fully entangled state in a time which scales with the inverse of the coupling between the qubits and realizes what is called square root I swap operation. The interaction in this case is on when the qubit are in resonance, when the operation takes place, when the interaction is effectively off when the two qubits are brought off resonance. We consider the case where each qubit is acted by a local transverse noise, x1 and x2, acting along sigma x. So both qubits are operating at their own, own optimal point, which is what one wants to do, because if the qubit were decoupled, one would get an algebraic decay instead of an uh, exponential decay. So both are at the optimal point. And what we do is to apply local pulses, described here by nu1 and nu2, acting on the two qubits, in a simultaneous way. These are applied simultaneously on the two qubit during the entire gate operation, so in a time which scales with the inverse of the coupling between the qubits. And we consider the periodic, the car parcel, and the heuric dynamical decoupling sequences. The approach we use is simple, is similar to the one I described before. Let's consider the simplest case of two simultaneous echoes on the two qubits. The idea is simple, we have a propagator here, uh, with the two uh, S, which corresponds to the action of the simultaneous pulses on the two qubits. Uh, the propagator can be uh, expanded for delta t small enough in such a way, it leads to an, an effective Hamiltonian, and this effective Hamiltonian depends on the direction of the pulses. For sigma z pulses, the effective Hamiltonian is the two qubit Hamiltonian without noise, so noise is cancelled out. For pi y pulses, also, the free single qubit Hamiltonian is cancelled out, but the interaction between the two qubits is left. And this is actually enough if we prepare the system in a factorized state to achieve a fully entangled state at time 2 delta t equal to the entangling time. The, the approach we use is, to, uh, is both numerical and analytical. We use the, um, a numerical approach which consists in the solution of the stochastic Schrodinger equation for the coupled qubits in the presence of 1 over f noise plus pulses. And we use an analyti analytic results in the adiabatic approximation plus longitudinal or quasi-static approximation plus Magnus expansion. All these steps, in all cases, we evaluate the gate error which is defined by this formula, 1 minus the fidelity of the uh, final state to the fully entangled state, which is what we would like to achieve. Um, for static noise, okay, it takes this simple form, and if we, uh, by making a Magnus expansion, we, gener we, we obtain an effective Hamiltonian which describes the effect of the noise at time t. Let's look at how this effective Hamiltonian uh, which form takes this effective Hamiltonian in the case of periodic dynamical decoupling, and for the two cases of pi z and pi y pulses. For pi z pulses, we get the single qubit, the couple qubit Hamiltonian, so the two qubit gate Hamiltonian, which we already saw, plus some noise terms, which are characterized by having both transverse contributions, so sigma y, which are linear in delta t and linear in the noise, and longitudinal quadratic contributions, so along sigma z, we depend on our quadratic in x and our quadratic in delta t. This is valid, provided the number of pulses is larger than a threshold, which scales with the ratio between the single qubit level splitting and the, couple, and the coupling energy. For pi y pulses, the effective gate Hamiltonian reduces only to the interaction term we saw before, but uh, the noise term consists of two parts. One part which does not depend on the noise, but depends on delta t, which represents some gate correction terms proportional to, to the time interval between the pulses, plus some noise terms, and these noise terms are proportional to delta t squared. 
So this already tells us that it's not immediately easy to understand which uh, kind of pulses would give the best uh, dynamical decoupling for the gate. So we have to see what comes out from our calculation. In the results I will present, we consider experimental noise figures of flux noise, which have been detected, but these are measurements performed by the same group. The peculiarity is that in two different experiments with two different detection techniques, they could find a one over F behavior with the same slope, but in completely different frequency ranges. Here, a very small frequencies, here, a larger frequencies. So the result is that we are assuming that we have a noise which has this amplitude here, expressed in these units as usual, extending between 1 hertz and 10 megahertz, which is what is presumably happening according to these measurements in these two different schemes. And now I'll show you the result of this analysis. Let's look at the action of Pisi pulses and compare the effect for the periodic, carpal cell, and uric dynamical decoupling. This is the expression of the gate error for large number of applied pulses. But before going to that, let's look what happened to for small number of applied pulses. Under this condition here, this is the gate error at the entangling gate time as a function of the number of applied pulses. So here, n equals 0 is the gate without any pulse application. So this is the error we would get without doing any dynamical decoupling. Here we indicate the number of pulses we apply, and we see that for a small number of applied pulses, we have an error which is even larger than the error we would have by letting the, the gate evolve in the presence of 1 over f noise. And this is an anti-Zeno behavior which was already predicted at the single qubit level. So in order to get an improvement, we need to apply a larger number of pulses where this analytic expression described what happens. And we see here that we have basically a different power law dependence with n, with the strongest uh, effect coming from the Heurig dynamical decoupling, which is displayed here. But it, what is even more peculiar of the Heurig dynamical decoupling is that the error depends on sigma 4 as a difference for what happens for PDD and car parcel, where the error scale which, uh, scales with sigma squared. The reason for this behavior is intrinsic to the Uric dynamical decoupling sequence, which is designed to reduce the lowest order effect of Gaussian noise. So this dependence on sigma 4 points to an effect due to the fourth order statistics of the process. And naturally, to be more confident in this, we made this comparison. We compared the uh, action of the Uric dynamical decoupling sequence uh, in the two cases where we have 1 over f noise, a random telegraph noise, which have been generated in such a way that they have the same second order statistics, so on the same variant, zero average and equal second order statistics, but of course different fourth order statistics. And what we see here, this is the result, the crosses are for 1 over f noise dotted for random telegraph noise, and the colors correspond to, do, to two different values of the second order statistics expressed by the noise variance. And what we see here is that for small number of applied pulses where the dynamical decoupling does even worse than the free qubit evolution, basically we have the same result for 1 over f and for, for 1 over f for one, uh, random telegraph noise. But and this is an indication of the fact that the procedure is not, is not working, second order statistics plays the role. Whereas when the procedure is working, the second order statistics uh, effect has been canceled, and what remains in a, is an effect due to the fourth order statistics of the process, which is different for the two processes. And for this reason, we have a different behavior, despite the sigma are the same for the two cases, so one over f, a random telegraph noise. In addition to that, also the dependence on n is different for the two processes. So this tells us something about what happens for the UDD. Then we looked at what happens for pi y pulses. And this is a comparison in green for pi y pulses and in red for pi z pulses for the three procedures. The uh, summary of what happens can be seen in this way. We have two regimes. We have a regime of small number of applied pulses and a regime, an asymptotic regime. For small number of applied pulses, we basically see that 
for pi y pulses, instead of having a maximum, we have a minimum. So we removed the anti zeno effect, which is a good news. If we use the car parcel or the Uri dynamical decoupling sequence, for the periodic dynamical decoupling, there is still some anti zeno behavior. If we look at the asymptotic regime, what we observe in this case is that we have, in all cases, a error which scales with sigma squared. So this points to the fact that we have, for pi y pulses, a second order statistic effect for all the sequences. The power law behavior is, however, sequence specific. So the take home message of this part, which only looks at the effect of one over f noise, is that we have a large improvement for small or intermediate number of pulses for pi y pulses and applied at Uring timing. But for large number of pulses, pi z pulses are bad. For large number of applied pulses, pi z pulses are much better. And this is a fourth order statistics effect. But if we now compare the Uring with the Carr Parcel My Bungin sequence, we see that we basically do not see too many differences. So the message is that the Carparcel Maibungil seems to be the best compromise between the periodic and the uric dynamical decoupling in the sense that independently of the number of applied pulses, it gives a reasonable improvement with respect to the uh, gate evolution without any pulse. One last point I would like to uh, mention concerns the fact that in Actually, in experiments, we do not have only low frequency noise. And we do not have only have one over f noise at small frequencies, but the Q, the tail of the one over f noise, can be at higher frequency cutoff. So here we make this analysis. We consider uh, the effect of fluctuations with one over f spectrum, but with increasing value of the high frequency cutoff of the noise. Different colors here co correspond to different high frequency cutoff. And what we see, if we look at these uh, six uh, figures uh, at the same time in a, in, a, in a snapshot, we immediately see that in all cases we have differences. So the presence of high frequency noise components to a certain extent spoils the efficiency of the dynamical decoupling procedures. But however, we are not lost. So the message is in any case positive because we see that for pi y UDD, and car parcel, we always have a negligible anti zeno behavior. We have a minimum instead of having a maximum, so we do not have anti zeno behavior. We have a fast power law decay with n, even though with a sensitivity to the high frequency noise components. And we can give, a, if you want, a figure which tells us what we can expect in experiment that, uh, the, which is the following in experiment, with the experimental noise figure, we see that with pi y ODD here, or with car parcel Maibungil, for small number of applied pulses, meaning four or five applied pulses, which is a, an extremely small number of pulses, we can get about a two orders of magnitude improvement until a high frequency cutoff of the one over f noise, which is indeed quite high according to what is known presently. So this is a positive message. The possible limitation comes from the required high repetition rates, which is something which has to be somehow uh, controlled. So the final result comes from a trade-off between the uh, required um, efficiency, meaning that the error, the, small error the, the smallness of the error of the gate, and the capability to apply uh, frequent pulses. So this is basically all what I wanted to, to tell you about. This is a summary of the results in, the, in this presentation. There are basically two parts, one concerning entanglement storage, this possibility to achieve it by local control and a possible interpretation in terms of hidden quantum correlation. A second part concerning the possibility to achieve high fidelity universal to qubit gate with superconducting qubits, each operating at the optimal point and by acting locally on each qubit. There is, of course, room for improvement. There is some, these are some articles where this has been published. And uh, I thank you for your attention and take the chance again to wish all the best to Boris. Thank you.